Our final reading comes from church's letter, uh, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. This is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. In this holy scripture, listen for God's word to you. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, Just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of grace and love, may your Holy Spirit continue to abide with us in the midst of worship. And I pray that that same spirit would grant to me the gift of preaching. That through these mere human words that follow, we could discern a whisper that comes from you. So we offer this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. In April of 1999, country singer Kenny Rogers had one of his many hits come up on the chart. Uh, It was a song that told a story written by a friend of his named Don Schlitz. And the song was called The Greatest. And uh, with us winding down the end of the regular season of baseball and the playoffs about to start, um, I thought not only... uh, would it make a fitting introduction for this sermon, but with the time of year in the sports world. So some of you already know the story. Don't ruin it for your neighbor who might not have heard it. But um, the story is that of a, a little boy playing baseball by himself. And he holds on to the bat in his right hand with the barrel of the bat resting on his shoulder. And he has the baseball in his left hand. And he announces to all of the trees and clouds, I am the greatest hitter in the world. And he throws the ball up in the air. And he swings and hits nothing but air and almost falls to the ground as the ball does hit the ground. Strike one. He's not discouraged at all. He takes up that bat and he's going to have a grip that's even tighter this time. And the clouds and, and trees are not enough. He tells all the flowers and circling mosquitoes, I am the greatest hitter in the world. And he throws the ball up in the air. <coughs> And he rears back and he swings as hard as he can. And again, he misses. The ball hits the ground. Strike two. Well, Wade, you're not the only one that knows that we get three strikes. 
So he picks up the ball one more time. And as if the audience of nature had not been enough, he shouts up to God and all of the angels, I am the greatest hitter in the world, and throws the ball up in the air. And with every bit of strength, all the might that he has, he swings and does a full pirouette and falls square on his rear end on the ground about the same time the ball hits strike three. And then a grin stretches across his face as he looks up to the sky, seemingly not discouraged at all, and announces, I am the greatest pitcher in the world. <laughs> <coughs> he had a goal in mind to be the greatest hitter in the world. And he didn't meet that goal. And rather than get discouraged, he just changed his mind decided he was the greatest pitcher in the world. Most of us, the vast majority of us, I think, know what it is to have a goal in mind, something that we want to accomplish, and, and to work hard to achieve that goal. And sometimes in our lives, we have met with success, and sometimes we've met with failure. And sometimes when the, the failure happens, it can discourage us. It can dishearten us for quite some time. But uh, usually we get our fortitude back and we have some other goal and we strive to reach that goal. Now, I realize that there are indeed some lazy, slothful souls out there that live life sort of aimlessly, that never seem to have any purpose our goal in mind. And rather than be judgmental against those folks that some of us may know, let's keep in mind that at one point in their lives they may very well have had some goals, indeed some lofty goals and plans. And after a while, if we'll be compassionate, we know that life can beat some of us up. And it can send us into a season, maybe sometimes a long season, of going around somewhat aimlessly of not really having a goal, not really having a purpose in mind. Let us realize that as we look at these words from St. Paul to these Christians in Philippi, he is telling them to hold in their minds and in their hearts a goal, a purpose, that we might think impossible. An impossible goal yet a goal that has an estimable value, worth. Let's briefly, let's briefly remember this church. This is the church that Paul had the strongest relationship with. The church at Philippi receives this short little, divided into four chapter epistle, this letter. And, and Paul is always encouraged by them. He has so much praise for them, even though he's aware in this current chapter of their lives, they've already begun to face a lot of ridicule and some persecution. And so he, he, he writes to them to remain faithful, that he remembers them with gratitude for all the good that they have done and that they continue to strive in that direction. This letter is not like some of Paul's other letters, like that church in Corinth that he had so many problems with and he threatened to bring a stick with him to punish them when he came. Or the church in Galatia, which you may remember he begins by calling them, you foolish Galatians. Ugh, not the kind of letter any church wants to get. Not this church. Philippi heard the gospel. And these citizens, these people of this village, this uh, town right on the northern shore of the Aegean Sea, these people had fallen in love with Jesus. And the love seemed to remain there even in the midst of great difficulty. And so what is Paul's goal? What is his command that he tells them? He says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Wow. That does seem impossible. And right after he gives that command, he launches into what New Testament scholars call the Christ hymn. And we'll take a look at that in just a moment. But notice before he gives that command of let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, he tells them some details about what that means. It means to consider others better than yourselves. 
It means to be humble. It means not out of conceit to chase after your own ambitions, but to look at others' needs as coming before your own. That's what it is to have the mind of Jesus Christ. It doesn't sound simply difficult to me. It sounds impossible. Because the, the gospel is the story that because we're unable to do that, because we don't have the mind of Christ, that that is why God became flesh in Jesus. That's why the Messiah was sent, because we, we needed this Savior. And here we are being told now we need to have that same mind within us. Don't see it as a contradiction, although I realize we may want to look at it that way. Look at it as God meeting that deepest need that we have for Jesus for salvation and sending his son. And then if the salvation really becomes a part of our life, if it becomes the inspiration that guides us each day, then therefore salvation should roll into sanctification, the mind of Christ should start becoming more and more a part of who we are, even though, I'm not going to speak for you, but every day I have failures of sustaining the mind of Christ. I mean, think about it. Think of others' needs before your own. That's a hard thing to do. I'm usually going through with, well, what do I need today? And not just what do I need, what do I want to do today? And oh, is there any time left over now if someone needs something? Think of others as better than yourself. I think most of us usually go through the day looking at the people in our lives that upset us and we're checking boxes on how we're better than they are. And Paul says, no, no, no. Think of others as better than yourself. And Paul, Paul knows that this church is struggling in the midst of a darkness because so many of their neighbors, empowered by the Roman Empire, are beginning to persecute them and exclude them from the wider practices of society. And so Paul reminds them of the gospel with words that they may have already had memorized. Again, New Testament scholars look at what unfolds from halfway through verse 5 all the way through verse 11 as perhaps one of the oldest hymns that the early church sung, the, the Christ hymn. And so let's, uh, let's look at this and allow me to paraphrase, if you will. That Jesus being one with God, being in perfect unity with God and having all of the power and privilege of heaven, emptied himself and gave all that up to be born as one of us, to come to us in human form, not just human form, but to come to us as a slave. And to take on the scorn and the hatred of fellow mankind and to be put to death, to be murdered. And not just put to death, but the hymn, the hymn emphasizes death on a cross, the most ignoble form of death for someone that was a scandalous criminal. And then after this, this one who descended and came so low to be with us, God then raises from the dead and exalts not just him, but his name above every other name, so that he will be exalted, that every knee will bow, bend before him in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and that he, he will be confessed as Lord, and in so doing, bring glory to the Father. And so that's what Paul has told these Philippians. Okay, you have that same mind in you. Others before yourself, their needs more important than your needs. Now, if we think about this, I want us to, the logic doesn't seem to match up. Because how can we possibly love others if we hate ourselves. And some people really do struggle with what we call self-esteem or a sense of self-worth. How can I possibly extend love to others 
if I can't stand myself. And I know people who struggle with that. Call it Mondays. And then not only that, but to surrender your own ambition, your own goals, your own plans so that you can help someone else, whether they are worthy of it or not. These things don't seem to match up. But if we'll remember the core of the good news of the gospel message, it makes perfect sense. And, and sometimes I wonder if it has been so long for us that we have forgot the gratitude. The gratitude we had well up within us when this gospel first became the guiding vision for our lives. Of somehow having a, a feeling that our lives were aimless, of going without purpose, of perhaps feeling as if we did not have any worth, and hearing in this good news that we are God's beloved children, whatever may have been so said or done is forgiven, and we now belong to God. And something about that good news and saying we belong to that gave us the ability to look around at the difficulties and the struggles we had and the gratitude that we had for God's grace outweighed that. What happens over time to all of us is that that gratitude begins to wane. And in its place, we start to put ourselves first again rather than Jesus and his gospel but these Philippian Christians, Paul seems confident that all they need in the midst of the great difficulties they're having is this little nudge of remembrance. And from all, all we know, they remained a good and faithful church. And that's why Paul, when he finish, finishes writing this Christ hymn to them, reminding them of their identity to, who it is, that, to whom it is that they belong, Paul then says, all right, when I'm there with you, Philippians, I know you've been obedient to me, and now even in my absence, I trust you're going to be obedient. So here is a phrase that Paul writes that many people have struggled with. The great Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard even titled one of his best books after this phrase, Fear and Trembling. As Paul writes to these Christians with darkness threatening them. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now God, let's be clear, is not the cause of the fear and trembling. The fear and trembling comes from giving all that we are to God. You see, we're, we're good at giving tiny little pieces. When we, when we see someone in need, first we're going to make sure we spend all of our dollars and hours on ourselves and what we want, and then we'll toss pennies and minutes or seconds left over to those in need. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Your gratitude for having heard this gospel and realizing that this is your identity, this is who you are, it brings to you the mindset of Jesus where you begin to live selflessly and you genuinely, earnestly look after the needs of others before yourself. But with the looming threats coming in, you can sometimes start to wonder with fear and trembling. Is this the right path I'm on? The word fear used there is one I think all of you know. Phobia, to be afraid of something. Fear phobia. The word translated as trembling is the word that we have called trauma. Fear and trauma. You don't have to live very long before fear and trauma find their way into your lives. And the more as we follow Christ and we love other people and we really live with them, and our lives go on the journey with them when the fear overtakes them, when the trauma comes to their household, it also affects us. And Paul writes, even in all of that fear and trembling, with the fear and trembling, when the circumstances of the world seem so dark that you cannot see the light of the good news, Paul implores them, remember Christ. 
and remember all that he gave up to descend to us, the darkness that he had to face on the cross, and let that mind of faith and hope be in you, that even in the darkest chapters we may go through, that God is the author and finisher, not just of our faith, but of our lives. And through Christ has spoken the good news, the good word, over each and every one of you, that your life is everlasting and your life belongs to him. Every day, have the same mind in us that is in Christ Jesus. I don't think I've ever had a 24-hour period where I've done that. But it will still be my goal tomorrow. And I hope it will be your goal. Because even though it seems to be an impossible goal to me, get this, here's the good news. Even though we may not be able to reach that goal, God, by his grace, has already declared it to be our destiny. And that's why we gather at this table. Amen.